and we are live. So uh, welcome to this week's uh, webinar, uh, the A to Z of money for your tiny entrepreneur. Um, just before we get started, just want to make sure everyone can hear us. You can see us, you can see this slide, everything's working on the tech side of things, and we'll get on to this evening's webinar. It's echoing apparently, so we might get our uh, tech support in here. And uh, is anyone else hearing that it's echoing, or is it just leads that it is as echoing? We echoing everyone, or hey, John, how are you going? Hey, Daniel, echoing. George, echoing. Everyone's saying it's echoing. So we've got. We've got tech, tech over here coming in to fix up this. So uh, just hang to get everything fixed up. I've really, really got to bring the other computer back here. Uh, There we go. How's everything now? Can you hear the echoing still? Is the echoing finished? Is the echoing stopped? Josh has said he's watching the webinar while they eat dinner at the casino. Always learning. Good work, Josh. <laughs> There's still an echo here. Is it two mics? Someone said it's two mics. Mute one of the microphones, someone is saying. I don't know. Sure. How's how's that sound now, guys? Is that all going okay? You can hear us? That's better. That's better. Okay, awesome. Perfect. Perfect. Um, let's see which mic is working and which one isn't. So that's all right. Cool guys. Well, sorry for the little glitch at the start. Uh tonight we have something interesting to talk about. Uh I know um as a community it's actually interesting that um, I've had, you know, lots, I've actually just on the a phone, I was doing a map session with uh, one of my investors and I spoke to him for the first time about eight years ago and um, hadn't spoken for the last couple of years. He got to 18 properties and he wants to get to 25 in the next year and, and all that. And um, I, I look at my investors over the last decade and I can see a lot of your names in here. I can see, you know, the cool things that we've done uh, together with building out the portfolio. And I've actually got a few of my investors, when I say a few, I don't know, maybe 10% of my investors, which are now bringing second generation. So I might have met someone 10 years ago and they've got a 10 year old kid or they've got a 15 year old kid and now that kid's old enough and they're buying properties and they're investing and they're following in the parents' footsteps and there's you know, things there to learn from the parents. And you know, you're not taught at school um, you know, how to become successful. They teach you how to um, you know, be an obedient tax slave. They teach you how to you know, sort of, um, you know, fit into the system, but they don't teach you how to break away from it. And Jeremy and I were talking about this last night, Ailey, mm -hmm. about, you know, the system is designed to, it properly gives you freedom, so they don't want yes. you to have the freedom. So, you know, it's, uh, it's, they don't teach you this sort of stuff. So thought we'd have an interesting, different type of conversation. Hayley, uh, maybe just give us a bit of a background. You've got a book here, maybe show, show your book, talk about the book, what it is. Do I, do. I wrote this book. The A to Z of Money for Your Tiny Entrepreneur. Um, I wrote it in collaboration with my dad. So he has five kids. Um, I think his greatest money lessons came from what not to do. <laughs> uh, so he was uh, owned several successful marketing agencies in Sydney, New York and New Zealand. And when the GFC hit, he pretty much lost everything overnight, um, had never invested his cash flow into any other income streams um, and had never safeguarded himself. So it definitely led all of us kids down a different path. Um, two of his, or three of them, all own their own businesses and myself, um, and my older brother have both invested in property and um, yeah we've gone down that road of creating multiple income streams which we were definitely never taught at school. Okay and I've got a question here from Damien here and he goes great topic Nathan team wondering what suggestions are there with pocket money and household chores with my kids. I've actually got an answer for that. Um, my nephew so I've got um, a dozen nieces and nephews and my nephews um, like I grew up in a, I've told everyone my story over the years, but 
my nephews, I actually have two of them, which, uh, you know, they had an interest. They're like, Nathan, why are you different? Like, they'd see all my sports cars and stuff like that over the years. And uh, I had this game. I heard this guy. His name's Caleb Maddox. He's actually, um, he was this kid. He was like 11 years old, and his dad set him up as like being an entrepreneur. And I think now he's about 20 or something. But he had this thing where he said that he went to his friend's house, and he asked, his friend said, hey, can I do some chores to do the washing? Can I do some dishes? Whatever. And his parents gave him 20 bucks. Go, what? don't take the bin out. Go do this. Go do that. So this Caleb Maddox bloke went home to his parents and said, hey, um, I want to do some chores. I want to earn some money. And he goes, look, you live in this house. You're using the things from the house. You know, you're getting food cooked every day. You're getting your bed made, getting your clothes washed. I expect that you do chores, right? The, the, the right is that you should be doing the chores for participating in the household. Mm -hmm. He said, I'll give you $50 every time you read a book. So I thought I'd play this game with my nephews. And I bought them some books and I told them to watch these YouTube videos and said, every YouTube video you watch, write me a little report, just a one page report. I'll give you 10 bucks each time you write a report about the things that you learned from it. They never fucking did it, right? <laughs> but, you know, it's training and it's like, I can go keep pushing. I bought them the books and stuff like that. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, all those sort of books from them, yes. like 10 or 11, yeah. 12. But, you know, uh, I can teach them stuff, but they go home. And I actually said to my brother, bring the kids in, give them Christmas holidays, I'll make them come in my office. My brother said to me, oh, what are they going to get paid? I'm like, they're not fucking doing anything in my office, right? So it's really a, a, a divide of my mindset against my brother's mindset and, you know, things that you can implement into children and, you know, giving kids chores and pocket money, there's different things that you can do, but let's go on and explore those sorts of things this evening. We so do look at that later on. So tonight's agenda, do you want to read it out, Hayley? Our school system cannot be relied upon to teach children about money management. Misconceptions about money management need learnt by the younger generation. How do we equip our children with the knowledge of basic finances that they will apply throughout their life? Financial terms all parents should teach their children. Good money habits. Get your children involved in money making decisions and encourage your children to make money work for them. There we go. Lots of interesting stuff here today. So you've already talked about your book. Yeah. There you go. Maybe read out a couple of words from the book, like just a word and like a word that people wouldn't even get. Like you walk in the street and you speak to a trader, you speak to someone down at the well, probably the most um, fitting one for where the world is currently at okay. would be what we did for Q. <laughs> Here we go. Which is quantitative easing. <laughs> so a lot of adults don't don't understand what quantitative easing is. When did you publish this book, by the way? So this was published in 2020. Wow, way before QE started, eh? Way before QE. There we go. So we're ahead of our time. Um, but actually, we have had a lot of. So this is in quite a few school libraries now. I've had, I've got quite a few nieces and nephews myself, um, and friends' kids that have hide it from their school library but I've had a lot of parents say to me that there are terms in this book that they had no clue on and quantitative easing is probably one of them. That's, that's, the, that's the aim of the game right that's the aim of the game that's the banker's game so looking at you know jumping straight into it the, the school system like that's probably the first part right like you go to a 12 year indoctrination camp to become a good tax slave and to fit into the system why doesn't the school system teach you about that? Well, then you wouldn't be a tax slave. <laughs> so if you look at the school system, it is, particularly these days, I think, it's devised to take away all creative thinking from children, right? Mm -hmm. So you go K to 12, and then the way forward is to go to university and get yourself a nice, needy hex debt, and hopefully- 100 grand in debt. 100 grand in debt, like, you know, minimum these days, and then get a job where you're going to be paying that off um, over the next, you know, yeah. however long. Um, but creative thinking is really the root of all success because if you don't have people that think creatively, they're not solving problems, then they're just going to fit into your system. Exactly. I don't think I've ever met anyone that's got like a, I don't know, like a Lambo or a Rolls Royce or something like that. And goes, you know, I got my cool car because I've got a good degree in, I don't know, my fifth master's in whatever, I don't know, Bachelor biology. of Biology, right? Yeah. yeah. I've never seen anyone that's come out and said, hey, I've got 
a university degree, that's enabled me to go get a Lambo, it's enabled me to go get a Rolls Royce. So. Funny thing is, the other day I was talking to a doctor, so you would like imagine that a doctor gets paid quite a good income. Yeah, you get right? a half a mil, quarter of a mil, yeah. half a mil, yeah. So they're in the process of buying a house, right? $1.2 million house. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get the loan because of their hex debt. <laughs> So what's the point then? Yeah. You've got people who are on, you know, like the investors that you deal with, some of them might only be on 80,000 and they're leaps and bounds ahead of these doctors because they don't have a hex debt holding them back. So mm. even just the debt that's attached to your education is designed to hold you back. Yeah. You, you, you can't, you turn 17, you can't sign a legal document to go become uh, an owner of a property, you can't sign a legal document to take out debt to start up a business, you can't go and set up a company at the age of 17, but you can go and sign yourself up to debt that will not be eradicated if you, you know, yeah, go bankrupt yeah. or anything. So, yeah. Yeah. and I think the whole school system as well, like down from the programming, right? So, uh, um, when was it, I think, I think the movie would have been, I think it's that Lucy movie where they, have you seen the Lucy movie? It's about Lucy. Anyone seen the movie Lucy? It's um, it's a movie where you use, I think we use like 10% of our brain capacity, 15% of our brain capacity throughout our life. But it was like this drug that they injected that made you live at 100% brain capacity. It was like kind of like the Matrix, like a weird oh, movie, right? Okay. There was that one with Bradley Cooper where they take a pill and it unlocks a certain percentage of your brain, but it wasn't called Lucy. Yeah, I don't know. No, no, it's Lucy. Limitless. No, there's one called Lucy. Right. And I forget where I was going with that actually. I don't think they're giving those drugs out to kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. But the point, I think it was at the start of the movie, of the Lucy movie, where they said, look, the reason why they created this drug is that by the age of 12, your body produces a chemical which enables you to grow and learn. So as you're a child, you're learning, you're growing, um, and you are uh, developing your brain. And they take the kid, they take the kid at the age of four or five or whatever they take a kid at, and they go and throw them into a 12-year indoctrination camp. These 12-year indoctrination camps never existed uh, before 1913. So it's only been about 100 years that schooling yeah. systems existed, uh, the tax systems existing. And um, yeah, the, the, the position of when they take a child to put them into these camps of a school, <laughs> so I'm just sitting here, just, just, just Jeff Berwick and Lucy. <laughs> it's Lucy and Jeff. Um, but the thing is, is that um, the, the brain stops developing at the age of 12 or so, and they're programming the children to yeah. stop having creativity. They've got the bell going off just like a cattle. You can get up, don't ask any questions. You can do this, do this. You can fit inside of this. If you sit outside of that, like at school, you can eat at this time. You can eat this time. Yeah. Be a good, obedient slave. Everyone you know, wears a uniform, so we're all the same. Well, that's communism. Communism, <laughs> communism right? Communism dressed up makes us all the le the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Everyone gets a participation award. At least we didn't have that at school. There was some healthy competition. But really? kids these days, yeah, we had healthy competition. Really? We just getting. I just failed everything. I failed everything at Did school. Did you compete in sports? Never played sport in my life. Yeah, right. That explains <laughs> a lot. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, Got a comment here from Tommy. Hey team, great content to discuss and review. What would you recommend for parents to do to motivate children to move away from conforming to the current systems, education, and perceived normality to live life? Wishing you the best and thank you for what you do. Thanks, Tommy. Appreciate that. Um, I'll answer that and then we'll get on to the other slides. Sure, but that's a good one. What would you say? Um, look, I think navigating raising kids in the current world is so complex. I've got one-year-olds and um, they will be homeschooled, but I just don't want to deal with the questions that's going to come up because when you look at all the information that kids are hit with these days, it is a really tough one. Um, I think the best way would be to show them a different way. I think that's the kids mirror what you do if you're showing them, you know, people who are doing things differently and how they're succeeding, showing them different YouTube channels. Um, that's all you can really do is try and show them a different way of thinking, really. It creating, like, I was going to get into this a little bit later. I'll touch on just um, something that I heard recently. I, I was my niece's 21st birthday and um, my uh, nephew, he's like 14 or 15 or something. 
and he's my sister-in-law's mother so his grandmother came over and I just remember saying to him I overheard it out of the corner of my ear and I was like that is so wrong right but she said what are you going to do when you finish school what job are you going to get what are you going to study at university and I just thought to myself I didn't say anything I bit my tongue I was like that's but to ask the kid, what are you going to do when you finish school? Like, what job are you going to do? It's like, who cares if you want to have a job? What happens if you want to sit on the computer and play computer games all day? What happens if you want to go and become a sports person? And you see all these stories of people out there that are like, I wanted to be a comedian and my parents told me that I had to go to the army and that I didn't do the right thing. And, you know, me and my parents didn't speak and I became the number one comedian in the world, or whatever the case yeah, might be. Yeah. So I think the questions that parents ask, because the system is so ingrained, the system we've seen in the last two years, that you know parents are you know indoctrinated into what the news says, and they indoctrinated into what you know what to do with your body and all those sort of things, what society says yeah. it should do, and it's coached. You know everyone used to watch the Channel Seven news at six o'clock at night and all that sort of stuff, and that's what society is. It's like it's the grandparent should ask the child, the grandchild hey, what should you do? You know, what do you want to do when you finish school? What call, What are you going to study at university? It's like, fuck university. Uh, something recently I, I just remembered about, and it's no disrespect, if someone wants to go and become a doctor or a, oh, yeah. a, a lawyer or someone that's going to contribute to society. And even that as well, right? Even that is a different topic. But if you want to become a good person at delivering a, a task to society, you need to go get that award to go and practice. Yeah. Well, then go do that. But... You know, I remember when I first started my career, like just getting a job, people used to ask me, like, I have a nice car when I was younger and stuff like that. I was trying to be a real estate agent and um, I'd have a lot of like Eastern families come into my office and be like, oh, Nathan, you know, what did you used to do when you studied at school? And I'd be like, I'll oh, just finish school, really. But they're thinking that I would have gone to university to buy some property yeah. and stuff like that. And it's like, you wouldn't be able to be successful from that like the people get trapped it's it's it, it, it literally strips you of all the the nutrients and i look at doctors and i look at financial advisors right and i look at i just look at a financial planner if you're if i was a financial planner and i always said i get financial advice if i was a financial planner i would have had to have gone to university for four years i would have been told how to um how to um what things i can talk about how to become an insurance salesperson and um looking at um, what they can talk about, they can only talk about a certain thing in a certain box. I would have been jailed 10 times over for all the things that I say on my videos because it would be outside of that box. Just the same as a, a, a doctor, if they say, you know, maybe your heart conditions because you are overweight and you need to lose some weight and you need to stop eating that food that you're eating and maybe you should stop taking up maccas and, and drinking and stuff like that. The doctor isn't allowed to say no, anything no. about nutrition. Because they're not nutritionists. Because they're not nutritionists, right? They're only allowed to sell the things in the products in the box. So, you know, the whole system is designed to keep people trapped, like with the food that they're eating is dumbing them down and the, the way that yeah. people are being told to raise their children, the food that they give the children, how they, mm. you know, you know all the things about the, the oils and stuff like that. Yeah. Like it's not <laughs> fanatical when it comes to feeding kids. It's, it's very important that you, yeah, uh, look at those things and question it. And um, I remember... My mum, she always talks about her mum, right? So my nan, she would be like 100 years old now. And my mum always says like about these things, she goes, oh, that's stupid. You know, my mum used to go and, you know, drink bone broth. And my my mum used to go and, you know, do this. My mum used to do that. And it's like, well, your mum lived to nearly 100 years old, mm -hmm. right? Because she wasn't poisoned with the food that they're being poisoned with today. And there's a big difference in, in how people carry it. But we're not here talking about food today. We're here to I talk about food. <laughs> But um, I think it's just empowering kids to think creatively. Yeah. And then thinking about that creativity, like even just looking at this photo, right? Let's look at this photo. Like you've got bars. Like it looks like a prison, right? It looks like a prison. It's just a systemized prison. It's a, you know, I remember when I went to school, I cried. I didn't want to go to school. I, the first day at school, I put bubble gum. I found bubble gum. I didn't even know what it was. Someone gave it to me and told me to put it on the teacher's chair. I put it on the teacher's chair because I just, I just, don't care, I'll just do stuff that was funny. That was my first day at school. I hated school so badly. You look at me laughing. I love school. I'll just tell you a funny story. So I am one of five. I'm the only one that went to year 12. Um, mm -hmm. Not 
for any reason other than I think my dad thought I was too immature to leave in year 10 and he says he just paid for me to party for two years but my parents had no experience with year 11 and 12 so they I just told them they don't do report cards for year 11 and 12 they don't do parent teacher interviews and they just bought the whole thing anyway they said to me if I got I think it was um 80 in my HSC the UAI back then I don't even think it's UAI anymore uh that they'd buy me a new car and um I definitely didn't get 80 but they were so trusting that when it arrived in the mail the letter was addressed to me and um they didn't open it I opened it and I got 63 <laughs> and I told them I got 85 <laughs> Shifty bitch. <laughs> and I got my new car. But I went on to work in radio at a marketing company and then I worked nine years in sales for one of the biggest property developers in the country and I never was asked what my UAI was. No one's ever asked that. Like never. when I go when I go to the bank, right? I just I haven't got loans for like three or four years or something like that. And I just went and got like ten mil worth of loan for some motels and some I bought a hundred units the other day, like a big block of hundred units. And um I've never been asked once what my UAI was, what was my school results, what my school grades. They want to know what's my net worth position, what's my cash flow, what's my assets and liabilities, what's my profit and loss, uh, what's my credit score, and all these things. Like a kid wouldn't even know what a credit score is. A lot of people wouldn't even know what a credit score is. People don't know what their credit score is. I think everybody should be like just watching this. Everybody that I deal with and interact with should have a connection to their VITA report, which mm -hmm. is a my, the Equifax or my Equifax, or whatever they call it nowadays. And you want to see every credit alert, every transaction that goes on there. If something goes wrong, someone creates fraud in there, how you can improve your credit file, how you can improve your credit score. Because that's very important, not this schooling stuff. And the schooling keeps you trapped in the system and it keeps you programmed to, you know, let's try and be a little bit better, let's strive for a little bit more, let's get an award and it's very conditioning and it doesn't allow people to jump out. If they do, then it makes them look weird and yeah. Yeah, well even like the whole kids should write with their right hand, not their left hand. That was back with the Rockefellers that did that because left hand is generally more creative thinkers. So they tried to break that and make them write with their right hand and if they were left-handed, then they were hit with the, um, whatever that, the strap and the cane, the cane yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So even now, like left-handed, they're made to feel like they're stupid, but. Um, I can't even write, so. That's... Yeah, well, anyway. So, <laughs> um, so yeah, when you look at the schooling system, the schooling system is really just designed there to, you know, to make you a tax slave. They teach you basic commerce, they teach you basic history, which is you've got to question a lot of history. I know you've told me stories about when you're at school questioning history and your dad had a bit of a your yes. dad your dad's a bit like Jeremy, right? Jeremy's not her dad, but her dad would dad be like Jeremy. Like what a you, conspiracy what you theorist long before that term had even been coined. I remember when 9-11 happened, he said go to school and tell everyone that it was fake. <laughs> they didn't blow up, they didn't hit planes and hit the towers. And he, in year four, I had to do a speech and he made me do it on why they should bring back corporal punishment in Australia. <laughs> got called up to the school. Uh, and also on Nikola Tesla and why he was a good man. And um, okay. he also did one on someone else very famous. But okay. I'm not going to promote that one. Mention his name. <laughs> um, so why do you think it is that, that they, they, they're, teaching, they're teaching kids to fit in the system. The schooling system was designed in 1913. Go and research when it first got set up. Go and research when... It's actually interesting for history for everyone. When did um, passports get bought in? When did tax get bought in? When did the schooling system get bought in? When did all these universities start popping up? When mm -hmm. did they all start popping up? It wasn't in the 1800s. Yeah. yeah. Well, then went away to war. Um, 1913, exactly. So... Anything else on this slide or? No, I mean, I think it does come back to school, particularly, I think it's more prominent now than ever. Like when we were at school, I don't think the curriculum was as bad as it is now. I look at the conditioning that like I've got nieces and nephews that are going through the schooling system and to see what they're being taught and what they're sort of being stripped of is far greater than anything we had. Yeah. I think kids still did have a little bit of creativity um, 
when we were at school, but it's gotten worse and worse as the time's gone on and you look at where the world is at now and it makes a lot of sense that they need good sheep more than ever. My, um, I was in the hospital the other week. Um, my mum had a, a situation and um, my brothers were there and they were eating lunch. My mum was getting a checkup or something and they were talking about their kids and their kids are like 13, 14, there's a few of them. And um, the things that they were talking about at their school, I thought if that was, if I was my brothers, I would be going to the school and building the shit out of whoever told the kids those certain things, right? Mm -hmm. I told my brothers and they're like, I don't want to hear about this. This sounds all too conspiracy theory, right? And then just, I was like, okay, let's just change the conversation, right? But it's uh, the things that you hear that are coming through the schooling system shouldn't be talked about at school, but the things that we should do, we never hear them talking about how to be healthy, how to, um, you know, how to cook food, how to make sourdough, how to, you know, what other things do they teach you at school? Like they don't teach you how to have animals, they don't teach you how to knit, they don't teach you how to sew, they're not teaching you how to be useful in life, they're telling you how to be a consumer, they're telling you how to fit in there and be obedient, they're teaching you. Well, see, they used to back when like our mums were at school. Well, my mum. They used to. My mum's like do, 80. <laughs> right. Well, they would have done it then. But then the feminists came in and said, you can't teach women how to cook and sew and stuff because it's. Yeah. That's, yeah. It's a whole other, so, whole other subject. Yeah. Cool. So, why, like, when we look at school, right, we all remember when you go back to school, right? What happened? They bought around the. The, brig dolomite. the dolomite, right? So, the school actually gets paid by the Commonwealth Bank to introduce their banking education. So a lot of people don't realize this, but the Commonwealth Bank have like the Dolomite, people remember their Dolomite accounts and shit, they get like a, they, you kid and I don't know, book. you get a book, I never got it, I was with a, I got a dragon, I was with a St. George dragon, but at school I remember everyone had these Dolomite accounts, they got a mm. book, they got a the deposit slip, they get a, a, a money box to put stuff in. Um, the, um, seeing the comments coming through as well. Um, why are the schools coming in? Why are the banks coming in and teaching the kids about money at an early age? What is the benefit of the school? Why is the school getting uh, like $10 or whatever it is per kid that they can mm. sign up? The school literally gets like KPI for signing kids up to it. Why? Yeah, well, the central bank own the school. <laughs> Pretty much. Right. So, yeah, and that's to keep them in a like, you know, you keep your money in a bank account and go buy some shares. Go buy some shares. And um, you know, this is the the process that you follow in order to come to us eventually for a mortgage and get a loan. So we own your whole life, they own your whole financial life. Your property. Yeah. If you say something bad, then they can disconnect your bank account, they can close your bank account, they can lock you up, treat you like a criminal. Well that's currently coming, I think. It's still here. So Looking at it like um, I've seen here, Mark said indoctrination in the schools has stepped up a lot in the last few mm. years. Um, so yeah, looking at, um, I've got a few little notes here, like killing creativity and everything's controlled. You said it beforehand, um, from the uniforms, the, the food, the... To everything in the school now. They've got to be there at a certain time. There was an interesting study done on certain kids and that getting them up at like, everyone has their natural wake windows during the day. Um, some people operate better at night and some people operate better in the morning, mm -hmm. but you're forcing everybody into the same system where they've got to get up on time. So you've got kids that are going to school that are potentially overtired, that then aren't learning, they're then fueling up on sugar, so that creates a really bad like cycle. Yeah. Well, we know that in the last two years, uh, they never showed you on the news or at the school they said put a mask on they said put whatever we you need to trust us to put stuff into your body mm -hmm. but no one said hey you know drink water get rid of sugar get rid of um certain fats and oils and stuff like that you know, get some sun get some sun lock yourself in the house yeah so interesting interesting um misconceptions about money management learned by the younger generation what do you think but. Well, I think the Dolomites program yeah. um, was definitely is definitely a big one. Um, Savings, go to yeah, school, go to yeah. work, get a job. Well, so. and the fear of debt, I think, is or has always been 
so big. Um, I think, and that is probably one of the biggest things, even I think in my generation, um, I've got a few properties now, but that was definitely a hurdle that I had to get over was not paying down debt, but mm. taking up more debt, <laughs> which can be scary if you don't understand the way the financial system works. Because yeah. if you understand inflation and hyperinflation and all those kinds of things, um, mm. then that's fine. That's yeah. good. Give me all the debt. Yeah. And I think that the system is designed, like I often think about it, right? Like I was talking beforehand about, um, like I think it was a couple of months ago, maybe three, six months ago, I was talking about walking along the the, the beach at my beach house and um, looking at all the houses that overlook the water. And I think to myself, who would own a house like this? Who could afford if like one just sold for five, nearly $5 million for a fibro shack? And it's like, who could afford to spend $5 million for that? Who would have $5 million in their bank account? What would the person have to have done in order to be able to get that? Is it old money? Have they owned it for many, many years, et cetera? Mm-hmm. And people don't have cash. Like no one has cash. If someone, let's say the average wage is 80 grand, 100 grand, 200, let's say someone earns 500 grand a year and they have to go and work and pay taxes and all that sort of stuff, 500 grand a year um, times by 20 years that someone's been working, that's, $10 million. So if someone earned that over that period of time, they would have lost half of in taxes and all those sorts of things. They still wouldn't have been able to buy that sort of property. And it's understanding how to leverage the debt. The game really works because you know, when I first started out investing, there was no books, there was no YouTube, there was no webinars talking about debt. I thought debt was bad. And yeah, Robert Kiyosaki was probably the only one who was doing anything. Probably, yeah. Which tab hold That was probably the biggest book around when we were younger yeah but they're also no one's teaching kids about where money comes from yeah like i think most kids just think oh money comes from the bank but they don't realize that there's actually no value attached to it anymore like they took away the gold stamp and now it's just quantity of easy. well it's it's you have a you have a a, a, a parent that teaches the child about certain things, you'd see that the parents, the child is generally a reflection of the, the parent. Um, and I think that a lot of people that are in our community that are watching, uh, you know, what I talk about and what we do as a business and whatnot, you know, are starting to understand where the money is fake. The whole world that we live in is fake. The system is fake. We're being lied to. It's a, it's a, a very bad world we live in. But the ability that you have and the power that you have to put that towards your your children and the you know the future generations that that changes right and I think just backing up what you're saying is there's a lot of stuff on YouTube um, what's this one here in school today we're still taught that that's the devil yeah, yeah exactly I don't know I've, I've never been to school for the last 20 years or whatever 30 years but I didn't even like school when I went there but the um, what was I saying I had a mind blank, got distracted. Yeah, on no, no, on 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 YouTube, there's like there's lots of videos out there where you can go and research about money. Like I can talk about all the things that I talk about here, but there's lots of cool publishers out there. There's uh, Mike Maloney, The Hidden Secrets of Money, which he'll talk about gold and silver and stuff like that, which I don't agree on fully. I agree on 50% of it, but the other half of it I think is baloney, and he's trying to sell his agenda and his views. Um, but his fundamentals about how money is created, where it comes from and all that, if you've got a teenage child, like someone asked me beforehand, how can I get the child to do chores? I think it was Damien. I, like if I had a kid that's like 10 years old and I wanted the kid to get off their ass and do something and be motivated and being able to give them the best leg up in the future, I'd be saying, hey, I expect you to do this, make them do all the shit around the house they need to do, and then say, hey, for 100 bucks, you spend the weekend you, what do you want? I want an iPad or whatever. You're not getting an iPad. You know, you get a bike, whatever. Uh, try and be healthier with it. And it, whatever you need, um, you can get that. But this is what you need to provide for me. You might need to watch 10 hours of Mike Maloney's videos. And from that 10 hours, write down. Uh, they might do one hour of watching, a one hour of writing a report, then an hour for a break, and then go back and watch another episode and get them to understand from the information that's out there. There is so much knowledge out there. People just think, okay, we'll send them to school and then they can come home and they can go and play and all those sorts of things. There's so much knowledge that you can give them, which is free. It's at the fingertips. What, like, 
if you guys are watching this, I'm assuming that you're not 12 years old or 15 years old or 18 years old, you're probably 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. What would you give to your younger self that you knew today that you would share onto those children? And that's what you should be trying to provide for your children for them to be more equipped with everything. Yeah. And you can make it digestible for kids. I mean, I like Mike Maloney, but I don't think I can watch 10 hours of him and then write reports on it. <laughs> but um, you can do like treasure hunt games where they find clues as to, you know, like where money came from and then what the bin. that way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, there are so many different ways, particularly now that there's like all that imaginative play and stuff that you're told to do with kids when they're younger. Um, there is a lot of different activities that I think you could do to get them so that it's easy for them to mm -hmm. learn. YouTube might work for you, but it might not work for someone else, you know. Mm. I remember going to the coin shop with my little niece, Evelyn, and uh, I remember I was carrying her through the coin shop, and like, yeah, load me up, I'll take 20 grand of this, 10 cards, anyway. I was in the coin shop, and then uh, she had no idea, there was just this big bucket of shitty old coins, and she was sitting in my arms, she's like, money, money, right? And her thought was, that's cool, that's about money, right? Yeah. What's cool is to then go and get a handful of that money and go, here you go, tell me all of which coins, where they came from, right? You can go buy yourself, you can go to a coin shop, right? And you could buy a mixed bag of kilo of shit from around the world, right? Could be every country, right? And maybe say, hey, I'll give you all the money. You've got to tell me which country. So you might get them to research and they might have to go Google, where did that coin come from and that? And then you can start asking questions. How come they don't use this currency anymore? What happened to it? Why don't we use pounds and pence? Why did we go to dollar and cents? Why does this thing look silver, but it's not silver? What's the metal that it's made out of? And become a game to them and then start yeah. educating. Interesting, I never thought about it like that. But that's, yeah. I just remember walking out and she's like, money. I was like, yeah. yeah. She's attracted to money. She's like two years old. She's like the first well, it's words shiny, are, it's shiny. Mum and dad would be saying, hey, you know, money is cool. Money. We need more money. We want more money, whatever. Um, but yeah. So cool. Um, add some little notes here. Um, covered that. Yeah, cool. Next slide. Um, <laughs> you love this one. Uh, you know, they teach about, you know, put some money away for a rainy day get some money, save money, work hard, you'll get some money, you'll get whatever. But the one thing I'd like to ask, here's something to ask you, if you have children, this would be a good interesting thing to ask them. Ask them, what is inflation? What is inflation? Do they know what inflation is? They, they probably won't know what inflation is, right? And then explain to them, well, if you had $1,000, let's give you $1,000 you could have bought last year when everything was $10 and make it mathematical for them, you know? A thousand bucks you could have bought, you know, a, 500 ice creams and now they've gone up to three dollars so you can only buy 300 paddle pops yeah yeah they've gone up more than that you'll only get like a couple of paddle pops soon but everyone's focused on saving and getting a job and having one income stream they teach you to get an income stream so you're dependent upon the system upon the end, yes for their healthcare, they can sell you all the other things that are required in the system but they don't teach you how to break free from that system and the whole trap of it is to send your kids off to an indoctrination camp to become a good tax slave and obedient participant in the system. So. And I think like it is important though that I mean they need savings to a certain extent say if you're going to buy a property but it's then what you do with that money. So mm -hmm. how do you take that money out of that system mm -hmm. and then make it work with the system like you play the system at its own game. How do you leverage it? How do you leverage it? Like if, that's one of the most important things. Once they realise that money is bad, then work out, you know, what's the opposite of money? Yeah. Is debt. We talk about good money, good money management, right? Just in here, like it's like I really don't like. I find that good money, right? Money management, just your word money, is a bad term to use at all, right? because it's not money. It's not money that we're using. It is currency that we're using. Yes. And people watching this, like I don't know how many of you guys would know the difference between money and currency. They are two very different things. The dollars that you use are not money. They are not money. We do not use money. We do not have money anymore. We have currency, which is a man-made currency. It is not money. So 
there's probably the best way to explain without going on a tangent is to go and watch the Mike Maloney videos, uh, Hidden Secrets of Money. There's like 10 parts or whatever. The first half dozen of them are very good. The later ones aren't so good. But just the thought of money, like the words that we use, be very conscious of those words and how you use them in our day-to-day -day life. Because, yeah, I use the word money, but it's not money, it's currency. I have to correct myself quite often. Because, well, like what Jono said, I sit the kids down with real money all the time and let them know that the fiat we use now is what the <laughs> yeah, that's good so, exactly. So the, the the real money, right? Like the real money um, has been used for centuries, right? You've had kings and queens stamp their fucking faces on this stuff. The power of leaders, the controllers, the rulers of the world stamp their face on this shit for their power and the status of what they do. Um, now they're just bits of tin, bits of you could get a piece of paper and draw on that's probably worth more because you can use the paper for something else. So. Well, and the way inflation's going now, I think you could take kids into any supermarket and pick out like five products that you buy weekly and say, well, this is the price now. Let's watch that grow over the next month or so. Like I buy boxed water because I don't drink tap water. I don't like it. Um, and it went from $8.55 to $9.60 now. So even that small example is such a real life that's like more than 10%. Exactly. Mm. But you can, you know, even like a chocolate bar that the kids get every week, you can watch the price of that grow. And that to them is a real life, like real time. They're seeing things increasing in value and that their money or their currency is buying less than it did two weeks ago. Every time I go to the shops, right? I went to the shops today. I was looking around the shops and I look at when I go to Coles and Woolworths, which is very rare. Um, and I, was, I look around and I think to myself, like, how do people afford, right? Like, if something goes up, it's like, oh, we'll just go chuck someone's rent up or, mm. you know, it'll come back, right? You've got, if you've got assets, you've got multiple streams of income, it'll go up. But if someone's got an income, just one fixed income stream, that's all they've got, you're at mercy to their income stream. If that's not being inflated away, then you're losing. You have to go, okay, I've got less options. Eventually, the shopping trolley gets smaller and smaller. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's very, um, yeah. So, um, sorry, Kelly, for swearing. We'll try not to swear um, this evening. I've got a very big potty mouth, but uh, apologies for that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, looking at um, the next slide, um, this one's very, very important, right? So, money, your currency, income, cash flow, what are we looking at? Like, most people talk about, oh, wait till payday, right? Or wait for the salary or wait for that to come through. You know, that's just relying on one source of income. Do you want to have just one source of income? I think that the last couple of years, you know, more evident than never before, um, being able to have multiple streams of income, people will literally work for 20 years in their job. And then they get told, oh, there's no job. The company's gone broke. And I think the next couple of years, we're going to see more, uh, more companies go broke than ever before and people will not have a job. So yeah, it's having multiple streams. So you know, if you've got one coming from a job, I think everyone should have at least seven streams of income and that's not seven rental properties coming through. Properties are great, um, but whether you've got a business, whether you've got you know some other sort of investments. Some We've invested in businesses. But you look at the opportunities that are available now. When we were growing up, there was no YouTube, there was no Instagram, there was no Facebook. I think MySpace just came out when I finished in year 12. I had ICQ, Messenger. Oh, yeah, like MSN. Messenger, Messenger ICQ. Yeah. There was Merck. That was like just before my term. There was bulletin boards. Yeah, I used to always try and pick up chicks on those things. It was like, fun. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know if you're doing any of those. But now there are so there is so much opportunity for people to generate income streams. You look at, you know, um, people that start an Amazon store with something that solves a problem on the market. The drop shipping, which was really popular a couple of years ago, I think now that's kind of become a bit of a um there was affiliate pages beforehand. Um, I think something that'll be big in the future will be like you know, even getting your children to go and get like, to do something that can provide, right? Like mowing some lawn, right? It can start off with mowing a lawn. Go and mow, you, you want to earn 500 bucks a week, kid? 
go and mow 10 lawns every week. Go and find 20 people that you can mow the lawns 50 bucks each once a fortnight. There goes your weekend, so you're getting 500 bucks a weekend. And then once they've, you know, been able to get 500 bucks a week consistent, then it's like, okay, how can you scale that? You go, okay, well, you go and employ your mate Tommy to go and, well, not Tommy from in here, just made up the name Tommy, but Billy. And you go get Billy and he goes and mows the lawn to give him 20 bucks and you keep 30 bucks yourself. Then you go and find more clients. So then it's scaling that yeah. business. Um, I think getting them to become active observers of the world where they can watch situations and scenarios and see problems that mm -hmm. potentially other people aren't going to see mm -hmm. and then look at ways to solve those problems because some of the greatest businesses, well, all businesses are really solving a problem to a consumer. Yeah. So if you can get your kids to come up with ways to solve problems that they have mm -hmm. in their life yeah. uh, or that they come across or that they hear you have as a parent, then, you know, how do you implement that into a business strategy for yeah. them? Never before, like the opportunities that are out there, right? Like I used to work two full-time jobs trying to come up with these. I remember once I had this plastic thing that I found. I don't even know how I found it. And it was like a plastic thing that had business cards in it. And I went around asking businesses to say, hey, I'll put your business cards. I placed them in like the local shops, go to takeaway shops and stuff like that. Constantly got people waiting for five minutes looking at the wall. And you just roll out the business card, right? You put people's yeah. business card in there and they roll out the business card and you pay for it. And you get them everyone to put like know, 50 bucks a month in or something. Like you're renting out the side of someone's fridge, right? And it's... Jeez, you'll rent anything. Huh? You'll rent anything. I'll rent anything out. Death still for too long. When, when I was... Literally, literally I did. Um, I'll go into some of my little things that I did when I was younger. Um, but uh, yeah, looking at the opportunities that are out there today. Like I think to myself, if I was a kid today in the world that we have, the opportunities, what we have, the resources that we have, you know, you've got the internet, like that's the most powerful thing out. Yeah. You pull the phone out of your pocket, like, hey, you know, most kids are like, oh, I'm going to play Minecraft. And they're like, just stuck at the phone. And they're like, you're going to take selfies. Yeah. Like people don't realize, right, that the tech that's out there is very bad as well. Like, so there's a patent, right? And you can go research this patent. I put it years ago on a Birch feed, but the patent for Snapchat is actually owned by this company called Inkitel. So all the mm. companies on the stock market are owned. They have their seed capitals that gets them to that point. Um, and there's a company called Inkitel that, um, just checking that everyone can see our video camera here today because it's, just just flashed, a, just flashed up saying that the webcam wasn't working. So if I can just get everyone to get, we can see. So okay, great, cool. cool. Once I had it happen and it froze and it lost half the the presentation. Um, Inkutel is actually the CIA that own certain companies, and the CIA own the um, the patent for Snapchat. So basically. Everyone's putting their dog ears on. It's, I find it interesting. Put a mask on, right? Put the mask on, right? Years, right? years ago, right? Everyone put a mask on. Oh, yeah, right? And whenever I saw that stuff, I felt like it was like an intelligence test, right? I didn't know why. I didn't question it. I was just like, you know, this is an intelligence test. There's something going on here. And um, you look at it now, and it's like they're getting facial recognition. You're selling your time, your energy, and all that for that algorithm to work, and then they can sell that tech on to someone else um, in the big wide world. But you have the device, you can either use it for good or you can use it for bad. Um, you could be a consumer of content or you could be creating content. You could be, uh, one thing that I'm going to do next year is I'm going to be traveling around Australia and I'm going to call it Birchie's Big Lab. And I'm going to be going to local little towns, taking one minute videos of say five or 10 different things in the town and showing off the local things they have in their town just because it'll be fun. And I'll be showing them out there. I don't know anything from it, but it might help with our motor groups and all those sorts of things. And, um, you know, I can spend the same time just sitting there on my phone going, oh, well, that looks nice. And then liking and just sitting on Instagram all day, or I could be producing content. And, you know, people get paid for this stuff. I'm not an expert on that. Go and find a way to monetize it and create a business around it. Well, again, it's never... taking the system because Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, they're all devised to dumb people down yeah um, but it is taking that technology flipping it on its head and using it to better yourself yeah it's kind of beating them at their own game exactly i think we're taught inherently that 
you know, is risk, right? People say, oh, you know, you get dead, it's risk, buying property is a risk, getting shares is a risk, whatever. The biggest risk that I saw as a kid was working 40 years of my life in a job that I hate, not having any control over my life, and then, yeah, just losing my life, basically. And um, Well, as Jared said, that they're still taught at school that debt is the devil. Mm. They don't teach me who the real devil is, so. <laughs> them. <laughs> but, uh, them. <laughs> um, exactly. So, um, a lot of people, you know, parents. I remember um, I used to go to a mate's house uh, down the end of my street and would have a couple of us would go there after school, like after school finished. It was like, well, school friends, we used to, you know, we were going out to the clubs and stuff like that and want to go work out. So I'd sit in my mate's shed and he had like a couple of gym sort of uh, set things and his mum would come out the back, she'd have a smoke, she'd be like hosing down. She's like, I've got four young blokes here in my backyard, I don't know, right? She just like, uh, like Stifler's mum, right? <laughs> she wasn't Stifler's mum, I'll tell you that. But she was sitting there and she'd be like, Nathan, why are you buying dumps in Mount Drew, right? Why are you doing this, right? You're an idiot, right? And I was like, I'm 18, right? And I'm like, I know I physically calculated my strategy, right? If my numbers stack up, the only thing that screws up is me, right? Mm. It's my emotion or my, you know, in my miscalculation or misguidance, I was very focused on the numbers and I thought numbers won't lie. And I had all these people telling me not to do these certain things. And my mate's mum would come out every day smoking a smoke and watering the garden and, um, you know, basically say, oh, you know, you should, should it's not for you, blah, blah, blah. Who are you to tell me, right? And it's like, how many people would be in your life, whether it's the kids' grandparents, the kids' parents, you just like thinking, you know, I'm doing the right thing, trying to help them not get hurt. My mum, the first property I bought, she was like, yes, my son, he bought a property at 18. Second property is like, yeah, he's doing really well. Third property, she's like, Nathan, calm down, you're gonna go broke, right? The fifth property, it's like, we need an intervention. The 10th property, it's like, you're an idiot, right? You're gonna go bankrupt. Then it got to 20, 30, 40. I never even spoke to my mum about it because it was constant fighting with her about it, right? It's like, yeah. yeah. And it was the mindset. So my mum's mindset was that a, a fear of me hurting myself at that point because she'd never seen anything happen like it. But I was pushing. Did she have myself. a fear of debt? Massive fear of debt. Well, she 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 took on debt. Like she she was a bit like myself, like nowadays, like back in the old days. Yep. But she just thought it was stupid. She didn't get the concept of it. And yeah. Uh, her, I could have listened to her and gone, oh, I better listen to my mom, I better be a good boy, right? But fortunate enough for me, I was like, no, I'm backing myself. Like, I have calculated this. And you know, sometimes it's hard for the, the parent. You know, my mum was like, no, this is wrong. She was only telling me from a good place of what's right and what's not. Um, but, you know, the impact, it could have a negative impact. If it was like, if I look at my brothers, they're very different to me. They're not out there buying properties. They some of them don't own a property, some of them do own properties, yeah. but they're very different uh, mindset. And I think that mindset was created. It wasn't something we were born with. We all came from the same place, but it was the mindset that was created over time. And, you know, it's, and probably yeah. teaching your kids to back themselves. Yeah. That is the hardest thing, yeah. right? Like yeah. even as a parent, if you don't agree with what they're doing, but if they inherently believe it, and they say, this is 100% what I want to do, then you kind of have to trust them. Some of the things they tell them to do at school is, a, is oh, a, like, <laughs> we yeah, won't go yeah. there. We won't go there. But I some just of the things, ask them when they heard it first. When they heard it from. <laughs> if they've come to the, if it's got a strategy behind it, if it's got, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean like smart. Smart like decisions. Like, yeah, not like. I think also like in a world today, Things that are, like, as a 12 year old kid, you can't go and set up a Comsec account and get shares, right? No. As a 12 year old, you can't go and sign a contract on a property. I remember I wanted to buy this property, right? And I remember I used to hop on the train after school and it was at Riverston in Sydney and it was $50,000, right? This property was on the market for ages. And I was like, I want to buy that thing one day. It was 40 grand. And I was like, oh, I wish I could buy it. I'd save 30 grand. I was going to buy it cash. And then it sold and there was nothing under a hundred and the market took off. Every time I'd save up 10 grand, it would go up 50 grand. And that's when I realized that something's not right here, right? And you know, when I turned 18, I just bought a property. But um, it was like a birthday present for myself. But then that thing, I ended up buying that at one point 
in I bought, Sims? Yeah, I bought it. I bought it for 70 it? grand. Nah, I sold it for like 100. But it was a, it was a crappy deal. It was like, it yeah, it'd be worth more. But I actually put that cash elsewhere out. But like other places, I wouldn't want to have held that property because it was one of those water ones, right? The oh, water it was water up. Like it was blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the point being is that like going back in the 1990. Eight, I was 13 and 2000 I was 15 and 2001 I was 16 um, I, I had options of buying cars right and I'd buy like old crappy cars and flip them I'd buy them for like 200 bucks and I'd sell them for like $1,500 I remember once driving to the shops I went to the local shops I was going to Winston Hill Shopping Centre and um, as I went to Winston Hill Shopping Centre I was like with this girlfriend I was with I was like 18 or something, I said, hey, 6, 17, I said, pull over at this car. It was like a Toyota Corolla, it was a little Toyota Corolla, um, and it was like 500 bucks. And I walked out, I said, I'm gonna call this person. I said, hey, I'll give you 300 bucks for the car. And they said, okay, 300 bucks. I bought the car for 300 bucks, had a Sony Explode deck in it, like the tape deck, right? The CD play, right? I took that out and I put it on the eBay, right? When eBay was really cool back in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And people wanted car decks. I sold that for 300 bucks, right? And I sold the car for parts. I made like a thousand bucks out of it. That was just all weekend. I was just messing around going to the shops and I was trying to do that between working two jobs. Um, I was going to buy coins because I thought coins would go up in value, right? And you know, some coins don't go up and some coins do go up in value, but there wasn't stuff out there. Today, we have a very different world, right? You can be trading different types of currencies around the world. You could be trading cryptocurrencies. Crypto is one of the biggest things for kids in the world today, I think. And it's easily accessible. Push a button, do it on your phone, gone, made some money, and whatever. With crypto, they can see it go up. They can, <laughs> they can see the it. <laughs> you teach the importance of a scam at an early age. But, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Or just ride the wave of the market. But mm -hmm. Nathan, let me ask you, right, because this is probably what a lot of people are thinking. Mm -hmm. So you were out doing that on your weekend. What do you think set you apart from your peers? Because there probably wasn't many people like, how do you think you got that mindset where you know everyone else is probably out just chilling out on their Saturday? I know exactly where it came from. That's great. There was no mentors. People asked me, did I have a mentor or that? I didn't have any mentors. I knew what I didn't want out of life. I hated school mm -hmm. from start, so I didn't want to be in school. I hated the thought of being in a job for 40 years. Right? My dad died 62 years old, had a heart attack, you know, went mm -hmm. to school, died came home dead. And then uh, looking at that, I was like, my dad's 62, he's worked for 40 years, worked for more than 40 years, 45 years or whatever, he worked for when he was like 15 or so, he should be out enjoying his life. And I was like, I will work my ass off for the next 10 years. And I committed myself to the age of 30. Um, and I started investing when I was 18. And I said, by the age of 30, I'm gonna be retired. And I wanted to just have a modest income of a thousand bucks a week. It was a strategy, it was a plan, it was an idea. I'd formulated it. Between the age of 13 and 18, I'd worked out that plan of what I wanted. I didn't want to be like all the other people that I knew, which were you know, 30 years old, 40 years old, 50 years old, not being able to stay in their rental property because they don't pay their rent. They were the worst tenants in the world and stuff like that. I actually saw my brother buy an investment property um, in 1997. I was uh, 12, 12 years old. I saw him buy an investment property in 1998. And I was like, I want to own an investment property, right? And I sort of followed from my brothers what he was doing and he bought like three or four properties and um, my brother now I remember once my brother came over when I first started being invested and he came to my office and it was a point when he was like shit like something had changed and he told me all these things what I should do with my life and that he came to my office and I said I've got to go to my office I moved to a new house got a new office got a hammer in the office I need to pull some nails out of the carpet it was like protection on the carpet of that Anyway, he came in, he goes, what's the office do? And I was like, I buy properties, you know, I do this, this, this. And he goes, so you've taken the concept of buying a rental property and just buying dozens of them. And at the time I probably had like 30 properties or something. I said, yeah, I've got like 30 properties that bring me rental income, all that. And he goes, he just looked at me, he's like, whoa, okay, like something's very odd. I was renting a house for a thousand bucks a week and his whole house of income was 500 bucks a week. And it was yeah. like, what is this guy doing different? And yeah, it was, I learned from a brother that was buying some property. So I got a bit of motivation. There was a bit of inspiration there. And then I had a desire because I hated the fact of having to go to school. And then I hated the thought of going to get a job. Because of my dad died at 16, when I was 16, he was 62. 
because he died then, he actually had this pension plan thing that said that if he died, then, and he had a kid in school, that up until the age of 25, if they were to do um, course, they would get 25 grand a year income. So I could have actually had a, a scholarship of uh, money just coming in, I could have got a free course, everything like that. Um, my mum told me that if I do it, she'll buy me whatever car I wanted. I want a Honda S2000. It was cool at the time. Wouldn't have even fit in one because I'm six foot four. A bit like that song. The wiggle wiggle. The money don't jiggle jiggle. It folds. Six foot two in the compact. If you watch TikTok, you'll know what that one is. Um, I don't watch TikTok, but it's just, I heard the song. It's pretty funny. Um, but I didn't want to go and... Um, go to university and I didn't want to do this. I thought if I went to university, I'm going to waste five years and I've got no income and I can't mm. invest that. And I had a strategy of being able to get to where I wanted to be by the age of 30 and I just ran with it. And people would tell me their opinions. I'd always listen to their opinions. I would sit and see how it would, what their opinions meant to the strategy and it, it would have no bearing. I'd appreciate it. That'd make me think a second of doubt. I'd be like, no, you're wrong. And I'd have to make the decision. And I backed myself on that. So that's Yep. Sort of the journey there. So how do we equip, how do people equip their children with the knowledge of basic finances that will apply throughout their life? What would be sort of some takeaways for people to, you know, equip with the kids? I know we've gone through a fair few of them. Yeah, look, I think um, involving kids in your money conversations or your conversations of what you're doing with your household income is really important like i said um my parents had a lot of money they spent it like it was never going to end and my dad said that that he thought it was never going to end and then when the gfc hit he lost 80 percent of his business overnight um how many how many income streams did your dad have he only had the one oh was it a business was it business yeah so you had active income yeah. And then he couldn't make the active income. Yeah. And he Dead. was fully in like, so 8080 80 started the business, shut down in 2009. But back in like the 80s, he was earning like a million, two million bucks a year. So he was on like. A million bucks in the 80s. That's a lot of coin. Big yeah. Big money. Big money. Um, but they never, they did, actually, they did invest it into properties, but they sold them too soon or they flipped them. They got into that fast lifestyle, new cars every six months all the kids were in expensive private schools. Um, it was like I say to dad, it was very much that new money mentality. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't willing, I don't think, to listen and seek advice from other people either. Yeah. So I do believe that that is an important thing. I have said to him before, you know, I wonder where you would be if someone like Nathan had been around back then and if you had taken that advice, even if you had invested like 10% of mm -hmm. your income. Um, but yeah, I would say taking risks, um, getting them involved in your conversations every day on what you're doing with money. You know, I, my greatest motivation was also to not end up like my mum and dad because I had seen what had happened. And um, that was why I wanted to make sure that I had sort of future protection where my kids wouldn't have to go through and, and see what we saw. Yeah. And um, looking at it from a perspective, I had a similar upbringing, not that it was very different, but um, I had no money. My family had not much money, but um, my mum was earning a couple of hundred grand a year in the 1990s, right? Mm -hmm. And we had a fish shop uh, selling goldfish and stuff. And I saw them go through a big cycle of making money and, you know, and they're not having money. And I grew up, people think I grew up in Mount Druid, but I brought property in Mount Druid, but I didn't grow up in Mount Druid. I actually had a, very rat's tail tells a different story. Rat's tail, different, different story, right? <laughs> but um, but I remember the first time I went to Mount Druid, I was like, wow, like this place, I'm scared of being in here. But yeah, the, <laughs> right? but the thing is, is that I saw my family go to, you know, no money, a lot of money, a little bit of money. They're okay now, but, you know, they're not, you know, they don't have a nice lifestyle, right? They could have a nicer lifestyle. And I saw how easy it was to get there. I saw the stresses that money bought. They say you shouldn't talk about politics at the dinner table, that you shouldn't talk about religion at the dinner table, you shouldn't talk about money at the dinner table, right? And I think, you know, why shouldn't you talk about that that sort of stuff, right? I think they're the most important thing. To talk you should about. be talking about it, right? You should be talking about how you know, people don't talk about, people don't even know what spirituality is today. People don't know, you know, don't want to talk about politics because they think it will create a divide, right? 
when you realize that none of it exists, like the, not, not the religion, the politics side of it, it's all fake, right? When you talk about the money, the money is the fake thing, right? What are people doing to be able to improve their position? People come together for two days in a week, right? I, I drive past houses every day when I come to the office and I see these little houses and, you know, I think about who lives in them, um, you know, who's paying for them. All these houses are only two to five, one year old to five years old, each house. They would have been, the cheapest one would have been about 600 grand before the market took off. The most expensive one would be about $2 million now. You're on a house with no eaves. Who would live in there? How much their loan would be? And, you know, oh, you <laughs> it's all those things, right? Um, and then the importance of, you know, how indebted these people would be. You see the cars that are being parked at the front, they've got a status to try and show off. And you yeah. think it all stems back to the the childhood, the, the trauma that they give them from, like, you know, being, you know, told to fit into the system and all that sort of stuff. They're like, they've Just got a, they've got something to prove. Loop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of it. So. I think, um, like, I look back on our childhood and my dad spoke about politics, religion and money at the dinner table. But the dinner table, we always sat down to eat as a family. And now there is so much research around um, how important it is that you sit down, even if it's once a week, and eat a meal as a family. And the impact that it has on children emotionally and their intelligence is actually, it, it's quite an interesting study. But we used to sit down every night at 6 p.m. and eat dinner. He was always home for dinner. And they always talked about their finances. So we knew exactly what was going on when things were good and when things were bad. And a lot of people disagreed with that. But um, a lot of people, like for us, I think it was actually a really positive thing because it exposed us to so many different topics as kids and it made us definitely think quite critically as we yeah. grew up. Yeah. It's important. It's important. I just got a whole pile of uh, messages coming through. I just looked at my phone for a second. I got sidetracked. Um, so I guess you know there's different phases of a, a kid, right? And your book would speak to you know lots Probably of different. Probably more to I. We wrote it for like the ten year old. Yeah. Age range. So if you had a how to speak to a baby, right? This, this is uh, interesting, all right? Like. What sort of words would you use? Like, what sort of things could someone do to help, like, from an upbringing, like, just about money, you know? Oh, look, I think it's all about mindset and, you know, the um, speaking positively. And, yeah, like, when you go to the shops, showing them, you know, what money does and um, when, you know, you... Like, it's all about, like, teaching them okay, we're going to go and buy this, this costs money, this is how much it costs today, this is how much we have to spend. Mm -hmm. um, that, I think that's, you know, really important. I remember my mum and dad made me save up for a Furby. Do you remember Furbies? Never looked at toys. Oh, they were these, oh, I loved toys. I loved dolls Never and I had loved a toy Furbies. <laughs> they were these, like, furry little things that used to make noise. And yeah. my dad said they were $80, I remember that. Um, and this was probably the worst money lesson because I it was seared in my memory. But he said I had to save up to buy the toy. So I had to do work. We grew up in my dad's office every school holidays. We had to spend a week with him in the office. We used to sit in meetings with him and we used to sort his dead mail, which was just a waste of time. But it was in a room and we would have to sort all the mail alphabetically. It was really boring. But it probably was good life lessons. Anyway, he said... You have to save up for the Furby. If you want to come into the office, I'll pay you $20 a week. And you have to come in another week of the school holidays and that'll take you, say, four months. So each school holiday. So it took me like a year to save up for this Furby. And I was so excited once I got it. I remember my mum took me to the toy store and she said, okay, we've decided that because you did so well and you saved up all your money, we're going to buy you another Furby. And it took away everything, all my hard work. I was like, well, what a waste yeah, of wow. time, now I've got two. Wow. So it's all, I've always remembered that um, because, like, I think as a kid you've got to, like, you've got to respect that they have worked really hard for that, honour that. And I would have just been so excited. I was so excited to go home and tell my siblings that I bought one Furby and then I got two and I was like, 
So perception of, of, of money, perception of how to, how money comes and goes throughout the household would be important. Yeah, and if you're getting your child to work for money, I think really making a note of what they spend that money on, how they feel when they buy something mm -hmm. and what that accomplishment feels like. And talking about that, like you'll always remember your first property. I always remember that. I remember my first property. I remember how hard it was to get there. But I think it's really important to talk to kids about those emotions that are attached with things that they purchase because that's what's going to drive them in the future. I remember buying a CD. I was with someone years ago. I was like maybe 2013. I bought this Eminem CD, right? And it was like 10 bucks. And I was I had the R35 GDR, chuck the disc in, gangster drive around the Kellyville area, right? Biggest gangster I could be driving around there. And I'm listening to Eminem or Ice Cube or some crap, whatever it is, right? And the person said to me, Nathan, why are you excited by buying this CD? It's 10 years old. And I was like, I never bought the CD before. And, and they're like, why is the CD important now? Why is it? I said, because my figure is that when I was earning, you know, $15 an hour, whatever, I was working two full-time jobs. The respect that I had for money was that I was looking at that and going, this CD is 30 bucks. It's going to take two hours of me uh, having to save up for that CD. Now it's 10 bucks and 10 bucks isn't anything to me. So it's fine because the price has gone down on the CD and whatever. And um, that was why my mindset, because I used to think if I bought this, what human effort and labor would I have to put in in order to be able to get that? And I try to consume it. When you're earning currency, i.e. dollars, i.e. what people would refer to as money, when you are earning those things, you're basically selling your time, your energy and your effort. And if you're saving that, you're preserving future energy that you won't have to work for. Mm -hmm. And if you're wasting that from over spillage and buying things that are not worthwhile, you know, still to this day, like I said to people the other day, like I've gone from the GDR to Bentleys and all stuff. And then the other day I was driving a, for the last nine months, I was driving a $500 car. And now I just bought, a yeah, I bought a compact car, right? That I can't even fit it. But, you know, it's the, it's the, you know, respecting like those, those times that are etched into you, whether it's from a very young age or, or whatever, very, very crucial. So you've got, Young kids, you've got primary school kids. Um, what sort of things like would you think about with a with a primary school kid, like an entrepreneur of yeah, yeah sort of encouraging, thing? yeah. But, and as I said before, like looking at problems um, you know, around them. Yeah. And getting them to see the world in that sort of lens of, well, there's problems everywhere, and that's you know how businesses start. Like when you started the buyers agency. <laughs> Correct me if I'm wrong, but it probably wasn't a thing back in the day. There was no such thing. There was real estate agents, right? But I no one had ever thought to employ someone to go and buy a property. For go, I can go find it. It's like, well, you can't exactly. find the portfolio, you can't find the expertise, you can't find the strategy behind it. And um, so you yeah. fill the gap in the market mm -hmm. um, and solved mm -hmm. problems for investors where they would have assumed, you know, building multiple property portfolios would be a risky thing, but when you've got a professional guiding you. So I think it's getting kids to, yeah, look at problems, observe the world through that lens, and then, you know, what can you add to the world? Yeah, of course. Jono made a comment here, he said, Escape from the Rat Race comic book from Robert Kiyosaki is a good start for younger kids. Um, there is a lot of games out there. There's games like the Rich Dad, Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki, um, business has a lot of um, cash flow for kids, cash flow quadrant. There's the, the game, cash flow, the board game. It's kind of like Monopoly, uh, playing games like Monopoly as well with kids. You yeah. know, they're getting too stuck into the phone. They're, you know, watching, um, you know, pink haired people on the YouTube saying, you know, look at this toy, oh, this toy, oh, this gun, you know, whatever. Um, and you can, what they're consuming is not substance. It's like, eating candy all day for their brain. It's not, you yeah. know, giving them nutrients for their brain. So um, Chris said he, not only the gap in the market, but Nathan set up basically a one-stop shop for people that are unsure this makes starting much simpler. Chris, we caught up for dinner recently, right? I said at the start of tonight's uh, webinar about, you know, people that have been able to buy stuff and build a portfolio. Chris story, Chris's story is really cool. He's got a really cool position. Um, and we're talking about his son that just turned 18. It's 
going to start buying properties and it's it's learning from a young age it's it's a perfect person i was thinking of as well i wasn't even thinking of chris before when i saw his name pop up i was like this is you know chris on the right track and um you always see when chris is um what, what do we say my son jared is here by himself um and self that Haley had referred to regarded school as the devil. Exactly, right? It's the whole system. The whole system is designed to keep everyone trapped. Um, and I guess looking at, um, you know, a, an older child, like as they're getting older, there's sort of things that you would need to sort of help them with and guide them with those decisions, right? Like the words that we say, like as I was saying with my nephew, what do you want to do at university? What do you want to do as a job? Yeah. Yeah, I, um, like I said, my, I'm the only one that went to year 12, but um, I remember my older brother, he now runs a very big uh, agency internationally, but uh, or owns and runs. Like a media. Like a media company. agency. Um, and he went to a private school. He was in boarding school. And his reports were absolutely horrific. Every time we would go and see him, he was in the swim centre or rock climbing or playing football. I remember my dad sat him, sat him down and said, look, I'm not going to continue to pay for this schooling system because you're not actually in school. Give me 10 things that you're learning in school and then I'll consider to keep you there because he said, I really want to stay in school. Um, he couldn't give him anything. So dad said, that's it, you're leaving school, you're done, year 10, you're out. And he brought him into the family business. And that was where he, he that's where he had his education. My brother's never been to university. He set up the company when he was 28. Um, and yeah, he said, I did my years on the ground in working for the family business. He worked for one of my uncle's companies. Um, but Dad said, unless you can give me what you're learning in school and how this is going to help you in the future, you're out. Yeah. I don't I don't see the point. Um, but we always they had to like my old my younger brother, he went and became chef because that was what his passion was and that was what he was good at. And now he yeah. owns cafes. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, at this age group, this year seven to year twelve, and I have these conversations with my nieces now. You know, what do you want to do when you leave school? What are you learning in school now that you think is going to help you in the future? Um, and when you get them to start thinking like that, that, that they don't really, that they're not really learning anything that's going to help them in the future. Of course. So if you've got a, a, if you own a business, if you have a friend or family member or someone that's got a business, you know, try and encourage your kids to go and see what it's like to be you know, running a business and the, the struggles in life and try and show them how tough life can be. They might be like, oh, you know, I'm going to go, you know, finish school and get a job for $100,000 a year and I'm going to get a cool car, I'm going to get a, a double story house uh, by the age of 20. But the reality of it is, is that, you know, it's, it's not that easy, right? And I think yeah. by being able to show, you know, for me, as I said, the motivation was the, the toughness. I didn't want to have to be like that. So I tried to work out at a very young age. And I think the younger you can you sort of set yourself up, the, the earlier it is and the better you're going to be. Like if you're 40 and you've got kids, you've got one income, you've got different things going on, it's harder for you to get started at that point than what it is when you're at 20 years old and sitting at home and, you know, uh, living at home three square meals a day and all that sort of stuff. Um, it was around year seven and 12, um, like 97, 98, you know, all that that I started understanding what money was. And for me, I worked in a family business and my brothers, like I remember my mum would pay me like 70 bucks or 50 bucks for the day for working or whatever. And I thought it was shit. And my brother would be like, I used to earn as an apprentice $200 per week in 1985 and shit like that, right? And I thought it was disgusting, right? I was like, I'll go get a job somewhere and whatever, right? I worked in the family business and I always thought about how I could add value. So I would do certain things in the shop. I would grow, there was this obnoxious reed, it's called duckweed, right? right? And duckweed would just grow. Like you could put it in a box, like a foam box, and it would grow and spread throughout the whole week. You'd have a whole top of it. But every shop would sell a little bag of duckweed for $2.50. So I'd sit there and I'd grow this duckweed, I'd then sell it to people and the fish would eat it. Yeah. I made free money every week, right? So I was trying to find things that I could put in the shop. I was breeding fish, right? 
my family, I don't know if I said it before, my family had an aquarium, a fish shop, goldfish, tropical fish. A lot of people don't realise that I know a lot of things about fish, right? Not like Deuce Bigelow, but kind of, right? Like that sort of fish shop, <laughs> right? Um, but I'd try and breed the fish. I'd try and, you know, grow those fish. I'd get little fish and I'd even to my dam, right? I threw some big, some little koi in there. They're like this big, I bought them for like a dollar each. And they're like these things and they're worth like 150 bucks a piece now. So it's, um, you know, hustling as a kid, right? Like I'd buy caravans from the trading post and the trading post would come out um, on the digital format. It would come out on a Wednesday, on the Thursday, everyone would get the paper format, yeah. but no one had the internet at the time. So I'd go on the internet, see the ad get uploaded, and I'd buy caravans and cars off the trading post, right? For like a thousand bucks, fifteen hundred dollars, and I'd say, "Look, I don't know whose name it's going to go on there. Can you just give me the thing? I'll pay you a thousand bucks, and I'll take it home, and I'll give you the details tomorrow." And people would be like, "Okay, sure. Here's the thing. I'll give them their thousand bucks. Take the caravan. I'll be like, this caravan's worth four grand. I'd take one of my brothers that'd have a tow ball, know how to tow a trailer. I literally couldn't even tow a trailer. It was not like my peas. I just got my peas. I was like, I don't want to drive to the city and pick up a caravan. How do I even connect it on? So be like, come to, come for a drive. I'll be your halves of the profit, right? We'd go 500 bucks each in the caravan. And literally the next day would list the caravan up. They'd put the caravan. Someone would come pick up the caravan. It would be gone, right? I'll make this yeah. off two grand. Um, cars, caravan, whatever it would be. And I used to think to myself, if I just had 30 grand, there's a deposit. If I just had 50 grand, there's a deposit. And I'd just hustle my ass off, you know, able to, you know, find yeah. opportunities to make them happen. And, and um, reinvest the money. And reinvest the cash. But if you also, sorry, on that, if you've got kids that are around the business, particularly in that like year seven to year 12 age range, yeah. um, even if in there in the, the, the family business, asking them you know well how would you approach this situation because kids see things so differently yeah to adults they don't see a lot of the problems and objections that we do and that also helps to foster that creative thinking yeah so how would you set up a, a young adult say someone's 18 they've just finished school right what would you what could someone's advice what could they do what could a parent do to help out what could you know well i think you'd look at what their passions are yeah and what their goals are in life like where do you want to be and kind of work backwards, backwards. from there reverse engineering reverse engineering yeah i think encouraging multiple income streams um is important you know yeah yeah um as a uni debt like unless they want to be a doctor mm. or a lawyer, it sets people back so far teacher, but you know like i said that doctor he's there he is 35 or whatever old he is wanting to buy a house and he can't because he's got a hex debt. It's crazy. You're a doctor, you can't buy a house because you've got a hex debt. That's, that's insane. That's insane. Nice. See it all the time. So, yeah, uh, we've covered off on a lot of this tonight. Um, you know, there's there's certain things that you could be doing, you know, encouraging the children. You know, most kids will want to just leave home and go and, you know, rent a place and be with their mates and stuff, teaching them of money, teaching them the importance of you know, being able to, you might want your kids to leave home, I don't know, right? But um, uh, teaching them at an early age, the importance of being able to save and showing them that, you know, they might be, you know, 15 at the moment, be like, okay, well, when you turn 17, you're gonna have to go find a house, or when you turn 18, you have to find a house. We'll be prepared to keep you here from 18 to 25, and then you've got the ability to save that budget. Well, then what that cost then, of living looks like. Sometimes it's not a bad thing for them to go out on their own to realize. Yeah. Holy shit, this life is expensive. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, working and workshopping and budgeting, even getting a budget. Yeah. To a to a, a, a if someone's eighteen, they've got their first job or whatever the case may be. The um, you know, helping them budget with their money. They're like, okay, I've never seen five hundred bucks a week. I've never seen a thousand bucks a week. Let's go and buy credits for our skins for our Fortnite game or whatever it is. I don't even know. I'm just listening to young kids rattling off different things, skins, Fortnite, sounds like something that's, you know, they'd spend money on, right? <laughs> My sister, she's got five kids and she recently took them on a holiday. Actually, they're away at the moment. But um, like five kids is really expensive and they, she, the kids wanted certain things in the lead up to the holiday. And so she actually sat down with them and said, look, to afford this with everyone, mm -hmm. then we need to do X, Y, and Z 
Yeah. So that's going to mean, no, you can't get the latest pair of Nikes or because we're sacrificing that to get to this goal. Yeah. And I think that's actually a really important conversation to have with kids. Yeah. Because if they're just getting there, then they, yeah. don't know how, they don't know what that journey looks like. Exactly. Exactly. I feel like we've got lots of... Um, there's a lot of slides. So there's lots there. of slides here. Yeah, yeah. Financial terms to um, all parents should teach their children. Well, buy the book. No. <laughs> we've got the book. How did, how did someone get the book? Uh, there is a website, yourtinyentrepreneur.com.au. I think it's on the Be Invested pages. It's on the, it? yeah, you can buy it from the Be Invested Be Invested page Facebook well. page as well. Yeah. Got some new terms in there for your kids to understand and to be able to teach it. Um, good money habits. We've sort of got over. We've got a lot of these things. Yeah. Um, the value of money. It has We're no talking, money. It has no value. Right. Um, it, it's it's made up. It's, it's if money is made up, then what else is made up? Debt's made up. The value, yeah. the value of anything is made up. So you, where can you create that value? Where can you build that value into whatever you are doing, whatever you're working on in your life as well? And right. as you said, your time, yeah. that if you're getting paid for your time, well, then your time is the most, like is the greatest asset in that equation. Exactly. So how do you, like, what's the best use of your time? Everyone throws around work smarter, not harder, but what does that actually look like? I saw something the other day, and I used this term recently. Um, Warren Buffett, right? He's mm -hmm. worth like, without going into how evil he is and all the bad things that they do and the companies yeah. that they invest in. But Warren Buffett, he's worth, let's say, he's worth a half a trillion dollars, right? He's worth a hundred billion dollars, right? Would you swap places with Warren Buffett to be worth a half a trillion dollars? No, because you'd be 90 years old. Oh, yeah. Nothing yeah. would work. You're about to cark it, oh. right? You've got no fun in life anymore, and you've your clock's run out. You've lost, you spent all your time, right? And I think when you really look at it from that perspective, you realise that money doesn't matter. The things that he has doesn't matter because the time is what is important. Mm. Right? So if you're young, you have the most important commodity, which is your time. You just don't have... The money or the cash flow or the capital to start off with and then it's working backwards and going how do I get as much as that capital as I can instead of being 90 years old and being 20 years old or 30 years old and having all of that capital and all the commodities that are attached to it and then being able to bring that forward so I'm and very and important. Achieve that financial freedom whatever that looks like mm. in someone's life I think that's such a vast definition for people yeah. but whatever your financial freedom looks like you want to get there as quickly as possible so here we're going to talk about you know what the video came looks like whatever the the, the cost of it looks like we've already covered that yeah um looking at like impulse buying like a lot of people will just make decisions and say hey i'm gonna just buy something it's important i go and buy it you touched on it beforehand you know with your childhood and you know, your parents saying, hey, let's just go buy something, impulse decisions, you know, what other things can people be doing to avoid them? Yeah, and I think it's not getting sucked into, like that again is just the narrative that, you know, you need to have the Gucci hair bag and the latest car, like it's getting sucked into that. So it's a, I guess it's sort of teaching kids to be strong enough that you don't need these things to be successful, mm -hmm. this is what success looks like because they're given so much data and they consume so much information on these brands are what success looks like. So yeah. then that's where you're spending your money, right? But if you can show them, well, no, that's not real success. That's like a made up form of success. Like they're filling a void really. Yeah. Um, there's that photo, which I don't even know if it's true, but I think it's Bill Gates and Henry. No, no, he's good. No, they've got like they've got they've, they've got, got the, like all the very expensive clothes yeah, on. The, yeah, the, the yeah, belt's yeah. very expensive, the Rolex is very But I'll tell you when I worked in development, um, there was this property developer and he's very, very wealthy. <laughs> He used to come into the office. So the developer that I was working from actually purchased their parcel of land from him. Mm -hmm. So he used to come into the office. He was dressed in like Kmart clothes and he drove this crappy old Hilux. You would have never suspected that he was worth as much money as he was. 
he would have been the richest man in the room, but he never came across like that. Yeah. And I remember talking to him once and I said, oh, I saw he, they had a, like a, obviously the last name, but I'm not going to say it, but I, I said, oh, I was in Bondi and I saw a BMW with that last name. I said, was it one of your kids? He goes, I wouldn't buy BMWs for my kids. That's new money, stupid decisions. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I think it's, you know, avoiding that um, perception of wealth. Yeah. And that, it's very much so like we all know people that will be on their Facebook or the Instagram and all they do is post up certain things, you know, hey, check out the watch, hey, check out the car, hey, check out this, hey, check out my clothes that I've got. Um, and that can be impressionable for young people, right? Because they're like, that's what yeah, success is. That's, what... like, that's, that's a hard, like, conditioning to unlearn. Yeah, yeah. Crazy, yeah. And I think impulse buying as well, like think about it. Every time I wanted to go buy something, if you go back to my goals, if I was to pull my goals out, and I, I have done it over the years, I've pulled them out on a um, couple of webinars and look at certain things that I had as my goals. Like one of them was to buy a PlayStation 2 when I was like 25 or 23 or something. It was like such a stupid goal, it's 200 bucks, 300 bucks, but my value was not towards the money for that. My value was to get that cash and go and invest it in a cash flow producing mm. asset. So, you know, the delayed gratification, um, understanding where the value sits in it. Um, you know, a lot of people want to go and buy the dream house, the dream car, go get all the brands, go buy all these things. But that's coming at a cost, the opportunity cost of something else. So always sit there and think, you know, I, you can go back to the shop tomorrow. You can come back to the shop next week and buy the thing. Give yourself 24 hours, 48 hours, a week, two weeks to think about it. And then if you still want it, go buy it. But if you don't want it anymore, then you realise you would have just wasted the cash. How much stuff do you have sitting around your house that you go, I shouldn't have bought it, whatever. And if you do spend that money, what does that mean that you're not going to be able to put money in? Exactly. Into? I guess you know the importance and responsibility of earning their own money. Um, pretty yeah. soft explanation. Explanation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, teaching about the danger of credit cards. You know, maybe credit cards look good in the future after hyperinflation. Who knows? You can say, well, that's still dead, isn't it? So. Exactly. <laughs> um, talked about having a budget. Uh, where are we here? Introducing the power of compounding. Um, I wouldn't say interest. That's probably a bad term there to have compounded interest, uh, but the compounded effect of the growth of your asset. assets. Yeah. yeah. So teaching the importance and of I assets. And I think it's important to note that like assets go beyond property, right? So like property for a five-year-old is not an attainable thing. Mm. My dad doesn't give my grand, like my grandchildren, my nieces and nephews, his grandchildren, Christmas presents, they get bars of silver. Mm. and that's always been his thing because that is an asset that's a tangible exactly. asset that they're going to hang on to so um i think that is also important like you know and if you watch mike maloney then you're probably going to hear about silver and gold um but yeah it's it's other there, there are other assets that are available to them that go beyond property yeah and they go up you know you can get them to watch the silver market it goes up and down we talked about this one here um, yeah, yeah spoken of that. There we go. Have money talks around the dinner table. Didn't even know. I didn't even look at the slide deck today with you. Um, just build a build a build upon yeah. what they're good at, what they want to do. Um, time. There we go. We've already covered that. <laughs> um, yeah, we talked about that. Okay, so we had some case studies here. Do you remember the yeah, case study? Yeah, I've actually got one. So my niece, she is 15. She, My sister pulled her out of school because she hated school. Um, and she just did not do very well in a school environment. That's just not for her. She's very intelligent, but she doesn't learn in that system. So my sister pulled her out. She's now homeschooled. She is fanatical about organizing things right so she will get a house in tip top my sister's got five children i've never seen a cleaner home this kid can clean it from top to bottom she has everything organized everything has its place and she came up to my house and she organized my walk-in pantry and i said to her ava i have friends that would pay that do pay very good money for people to come in and organize their home there is a whole series on Netflix that's built around this. Really? Yeah, a whole series. 
Um, and there's actually a couple of them. There is like the organized housewife on Instagram that has like over a million followers. Like it is a huge industry. People watch TikTok videos of people organizing someone's pantry and that's like their, their pleasure in life. Then I also think, so I said to her, you can build a business on this. And she was like, no, 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 auntie, that's stupid. Anyway, I posted it to my Instagram. My sister shared it on her Instagram. She's now got five clients paying her $300 to come in for two hours and organize their pantry. 150 bucks. There, there we go. There we go. That's crazy. Uh, there were some little scenarios here, like just some, I've got a few people here saying, so Tommy said, uh, what is an example of someone's kids can invest towards compounding to give them an understanding of why it's a good strategy? So maybe if you think about that while I uh, go through some of these examples. So this case study one, uh, George's eight-year-old daughter had a talent for making bracelets. She had a jewellery making kit worth $8. She had a lot of the kids wanting to make her one of them. She charged him $3 per bracelet and $4.50 per necklace. She had 10 kids wanting five bracelets and three necklaces, which made it $28.50. Here's an example of tripling your money, right? So that's, you know, you're still working for it, but you're working for it for yourself, right? That's not really scalable, I don't think. This one here is scalable. I actually saw this and it's something that I've been playing around with recently because of motels. So I've been buying a lot of motels and these washing machines are, they're expensive, but they have, uh, you know, they have, cash flow abilities to them. So this is another story here. Uh, Kelly gave a 16 year old boy five grand to buy 10 washing machines valued at $500 each. He pay, placed each and every one in apartment buildings. On average, each washing machine generated $30 per day. So if you put it in for a cycle, five bucks or whatever, six hours, 30 bucks, 30 bucks a day, uh, that's $200, $210 per week, uh, 10,900 per year times 10 of them, which is 109,000 a year across 10 washing machines. So, you know, that's a, an interesting one um, of using washing machines, right? I don't even know what this one is, this next one is, right? But I can see a picture of a caravan here, I right? I think that was you. Really? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is oh. totally different. We did talk uh, about your caravan as a case study. Yeah, I don't know why this is a caravan here. This one here is Chris's 17-year-old son, not Chris that we're just talking about. This is a different Chris. 17-year-old old son wanted to buy a Tesla Model 3 for his 18th birthday, so he gave his son 20 grand to invest and buy his own car. His son decided to buy eight first edition holographic Pokemon cards worth two and a half grand a piece. Don't know anything about those things. And he waited two years for when the demand of these cards on the market were high and they were valued at seven and a half to eight K each and sold them to buy his car on cash. So there's a couple of examples, right? So Tommy just asked for some examples. There's some examples of, you know, things that people could be investing in, things that you find as a hobby, like a Pokemon card. I don't know anything about that. I couldn't give you any feedback on that, but that's, you know, something someone could be doing. Um, the caravan, I don't know why the caravan said, maybe that was an example, but I was buying stuff. I don't know what that one is, but those old, you know, the old buy count ones and, mm -hmm. you know, I even one day I rolled a caravan home. I was driving home one day and I thought it'd be good for my mate, John, for out at my solar farm. And I went and I saw this guy had a caravan for a thousand bucks and I was on the phone. I was actually doing a map session driving past him and I was like, shit, I took a photo just off it as I was driving down the street. Called the guy up and I was like, "Do you want eight hundred bucks, a thousand bucks?" I said, "I'll give you five hundred bucks." He goes, "No, I'll give you eight hundred bucks." I was like, "Okay, cool." Gave him his eight hundred bucks for this caravan. Those things sold for like three grand, four grand, five grand. My mate just wanted it to stay at the solar farm when he goes to work out there, so I just thought it was a, a nice thing to get from. But I saw value in it. And I thought, you know, worst case scenario, I could sell it, flip it, make some cash. Um, one thing at the moment that I see out there um, is arbitraging of cars, and make sure that you do this correctly. But you could buy cars, it takes a year, right? So for example, just making an example here, a Suzuki Jimny, right? A Suzuki Jimny, they sell, they used to sell for 20 grand a piece, right? They now sell, if someone has one, they sell for 45 grand, 50 grand for a Suzuki. They have nothing in them. They're like a little flimsy car. Um, you can pick them up for 30 grand, 35 grand. You buy it, you can go sell it. You go make yourself 10 grand on it. So, you know, um, if someone was to go and put, 10 deposits down on cars, a thousand dollar deposit, it takes a year for that car to come. As the car arrives, you could go and sell the car, find a new buyer to buy it, 
and then taking the dealership, here's the money, you make 10K, whatever on and selling a car. You know, people could be doing that. And um, I was joking about it with my mate um, the other week and he's like, yeah, let's go and put some deposit. Oh, I can't be bothered. I've bought a few cars recently um, because I was sick and tired of driving my $500 one. But people could do arbitraging of cars. There's different things out there. It's just being creative. So, well, it's whatever you see value in, someone else is going to see value in. Yeah. So it's just, I think, capitalising on that market. Questions, guys. Questions. Let's go through your questions. If you have questions for Hayley while she's here, shoot them over. If you've got questions for me, shoot them over. Um, so um, where are we? Um, got lots of questions here. Try to say excited for this, hard to find good content to teach the kids. Um, uh, now we've read that one. What schools the book in? Is there schools that? Yeah, so it's at Shell Harbour Public School, apparently, Wilton Public, and one in Camden. They're just local ones around just local there. local schools, yeah. yeah. That yeah. was, I think, the publisher put them into there. Um, and then I've had a few teachers uh, message me who said that they actually purchased the book off Booktopia um, and are using it as part of their curriculum. There you go. So I wrote the book, I think it was 20, when was the first lockdown? 2020. 2020. Yeah, yeah, so 2020. Um, and then I went and had kids in 2021 and I just didn't, I haven't. Um, but it's still like, it you much. said it's still like, yeah. yeah. It's on Booktopia and yeah. Cool. Um, I sit the kids down all the time with real money all the time, let them know that fiat we use is now worthless. Exactly as good. Um, what have we got here? Um, as an 18 year old finishing school in a few weeks, what is your best advice you could give to get myself started? Um, look, nothing goes without doing input, right? A lot of people just go, you know, I want to go and earn a lot of cash, I'm going to go work in a job. Um, find out what your passion is. What I always ask people when they're investing into property or trying to do what they, they want to do, um, I always ask them like, what is the end goal? And they're like, well, I want to go and travel. I want to go party. I want to go and um, you know retire. I want to go and spend time with my kids. Whatever that is, whatever it is that you need, work out how much that's going to cost you. So your lifestyle, what would your ideal lifestyle? I actually had a boss when I was 18. I think I was 17. He gave me a camera on the first day. I was like, I'm getting paid to go and do this. And I knew later on what he did to me, right? But he gave me a camera and he told me to go and find everything that I wanted in my life. He told, sent me to go and look at a, um, a, a house, go find the biggest house I could find. Actually, I went and drove to the street near where I live right now and took a photo of some houses on that day, actually. Um, I was 18 and he sent me down. I didn't even know that a Bentley existed, didn't know nothing, right? So I thought, where's the most expensive car yet? I went down to the Mercedes dealership. He said, go sit in a car, take it for a test drive, whatever, right? And what he did is he actually made me realize like, okay, I want this, I want this, right? Yeah. And then I had to go work hard for it. But don't go do that. But just think about the life that you want, right? What is it that you want to see yourself? So you're 18, you're going to be different when you're 25, when you're 30, when you're 40, when you're 50, when you're your dad's age, you know, like, um, make sure that, you know, what would that lifestyle cost me, right? If you think that it might cost you 50 grand, you think it might cost you 100 grand, you think it might cost you 200 grand a year, you're going to have to now go and earn income to go and meet that lifestyle. So you might need 200 grand a year. You're going to have to work hard to find a job that's going to pay you 200 grand a year. Alternatively, if you work out that you need 200 grand a year, just work backwards and go, okay, I know I have to do work. I know I have to input something into getting to where I want to be. What's the most direct, easiest, simplest path that doesn't involve, that I can scale, that doesn't involve my time, energy and effort? Because once you've got that cash flow coming in, then you can remove yourself from having to do that hard work and be able to have that passive income coming through. So yeah, it could be property is one way. Um, you know, If you want a hundred grand a year income, you just need two grand a week, two grand a week you need say seven properties, eight properties owned outright, bring you 300 bucks a week. 
So you need to work out a strategy, work out a plan on how to get there, and then do the tasks required to get there, whether it be work, whether it be set up a business, whether it be working in a job, taking that income you're earning, investing it into a business, getting that cash flow, investing what other cash flow you have into property, and having multiple income streams. If your business turns to shit, then you've got your property. If your property doesn't work out, then you've got, you know, whatever the case may be. But you want to have a strategy behind where you are working on your worst case scenario. So I see so many people that buy property, for example, and they they buy the wrong properties or they have the wrong strategy. If you have the right strategy, you have the right um, numbers and the right, you know, roadmap business plan around that, you'll get to where you want to be. So build a strategy of what your life will look like sort of forecast of at 30, this is what I want to be and this is what I'm willing to sacrifice. People are going to sacrifice 40, you're 18 years old, people will literally sacrifice next 50 years of their life and they may not get ahead. So whilst you are 18, then work at how can I get that 50 year goal in the next 10 years or five years and then just work hard and get there and then be done with it and live life on your terms. That would be my goal, my idea. And check in on your goals. Checking on your goals regularly, regularly. Um, Kelly just said, I love the ideas, case study to share, great ideas uh, to get the mind thinking. Exactly. I just want to you know, get the creative juices going. Um, apologies for the swearing. I, I didn't, I swear a lot. And, uh, you know, sometimes I don't realise my audience has got the kids. We're talking about kids today and you put the kids in front of you. So um, apologies about that as well. But glad that that's been able to spur on some ideas and some thoughts and some uh, conversations and keep those conversations happening right because the things that are taboo that you shouldn't be talking about they're the things that you should probably really be talking about a lot of people don't want to be talking about that having the, uncomf the uncomfortable conversations but the uncomfortable co conversations are what's going to push you to you know to a better place so yeah um any Feedback, no maybe anything that you want to say or share or anything like that? No, thanks for having me. Um, yeah, I think the most important thing with kids is to just always keep that creativity alive and that creative spirit. You know, we get to adults whenever you can have imaginative friends and stuff like you did as a child. I don't know whether you played like, you know, but kids have such that amazing creative, creative mind. Um, I've still got the creative mind. I yeah, well, it. it's evident. Thank you. But, you know, they have such an amazing creative mind and I think that it is so important to foster that and not let our current world and our current society dumb that down. Cool. Thank you, Hallie. Um, if you would like to purchase a copy of the book, um, just email the team, details are there. Um, Kelly just asked, how do we contact you both in the future? Where can we follow you? Um, I don't know, Kelly, if you've been following like a lot of people, I don't know how you came in contact with tonight's webinar, um, the Be Invested community. Um, I do some really weird and wacky videos out there quite regularly. I think content comes out maybe two, three times a week. Um, check us out on Google, uh, YouTube, um, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, just look up Be Invested. Um, Ailey doesn't really have any contact details of how to... No, yeah. so there is the Your Tiny Entrepreneur Instagram page and we are going to be starting to put out content regularly. Um, but if you do have any questions, you can just DM me on that and I will get back to you. Awesome. Thank you, Kelly. And yeah, if we can help you out, um, just send uh, my team an email. If you, if you have any questions following up, um, email my team at admin at um, I'll just say, hey, you know, saw the webinar, had some questions for Nathan and the team will bring them to me and um, I'm happy to help out where I can. So uh, thanks a lot for tuning in everyone, uh, for watching, uh, spending your Wednesday evening with us. Um, keep being awesome, keep being creative, question everything, be like a child, question everything, um, create things and uh, don't accept the world that's being placed in front of us. Uh, we'll catch up uh, shortly and we'll go from there. See you later. Thanks, bye.